know what she did? <laughs> Your canting daughter! <laughs> we start realizing that we are mortal. Well, when, the, when a war is on, these thoughts naturally become uh, first rate. And uh, the fear of uh, getting in the war, being either wounded or killed or whatever, um, is not something that uh, you know, sharpens the mind. And uh, it made me question. It made me, for the first time in my life, it made me question really what I wanted to do, not what was expected of me, which is the way I was brought up. Uh, uh, not to you know, go through Yale and get into a nice profession and have a family and you know, live in the suburbs and follow in my parents' footsteps. I mean, uh, 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 I decided I really didn't want to be a dentist. Uh, this crazy profession wasn't even acknowledged as a profession in those days. I mean, certainly uh, young people knew nothing about makeup. It was not publicized. It was entirely different, um, a, 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 a entirely different atmosphere in those days. Uh, anyway, I wanted to do it. The funny thing is, I had no confidence I could do it. I really didn't think I had. I didn't, couldn't draw, I couldn't do th things that I thought other talented people could do. I couldn't do these artistic things. I had enormous awe and respect of the makeup artists in Hollywood who created these things. Uh, and uh, so it seemed like an impossible dream, truly. And I only did it because I was, a, I was afraid uh, that I wasn't going to come back anyway. So why not gamble? What's, what's to be lost? What's to be lost by deciding to drop my major? What's to be the first person probably at Yale who dropped his ma major you know, and took all the gut courses that you usually take the first year, the easy courses for the rest of his stay there? Uh, what was to prevent me? What harm could it do? Because probably would never happen anyway that I'd get the chance. So I said, yeah, this is what I want to do. I started as the first staff makeup artist in the television industry at NBC in New York City. Uh, television was then in one tiny little radio studio. It grew so fast that uh, five years later I had uh, 20 makeup artists in my makeup department and we were busy as we could be. But television went by pretty quickly. I was there at NBC for 14 years. Uh, then, in the 1960s, I left television and I was mainly working in films, but occasionally doing television, and I got a call from uh, Dark Shadows. I was asked to do this uh, special sequence for Dark Shadows in which Jonathan Frid, um, uh, Barnabas Collins, the uh, character, the vampire, uh, suddenly ages to be like 150 years old and stays that way for a while. So it was quite a challenge and uh, uh, I've done aging makeup before that for television and some films and but this was even I mean 150 years old that's pretty unusual so it was it was fun it was a bit of a 
a uh, bit of a rush. After all, this is for a TV series and not a big budget kind of thing, like a big film production. But um, uh, I did a complete transformation using what we call makeup appliances, which are pieces of flesh-like foam rubber that are molded to fit on the actor's face and to um, change the shape of it. Uh, and they covered his face completely um, uh, with all the wrinkles and the jowls and the sagging parts that an old person has and a, a balding head. But I covered it. Um, it, uh, it was bald to cover his own hair and then I put a white wig on top of it because we were afraid, Dan Curtis and I, that with such a transformation that, um, that he wouldn't be recognizable. You wouldn't know it was Barnabas anymore. So we did the wig uh, in the style that he had his hair at his younger stage. Uh, doing a transformation, as I did on Jonathan, starts with making a life mask of the actor. Uh, on the life mask, in other words, a plaster reproduction of the actor's face, you sculpt every change that you want to make. You take plastiline and you model, say, uh, an old hooked nose. Uh, you make a, you, you put plastic on the forehead and you model wrinkles in it. Uh, you do the jowls, you do everything, and you sculpt that as realistically as you possibly can, putting every little pore, every little wrinkle uh, in this. When that is all done, and that takes a lot of time, usually days of careful sculpture, with uh, reference to photographs of real old people so that you do it in an anatomically sound way, when you've done all that, then you make very careful molds uh, of this sculpture. And then you remove the clay from it. And this leaves a hollow chamber between the uh, mold and the life mask. And then you make foam latex by uh, beating up a certain latex compound with a mix master until it's like whipped cream and putting that into the mold and closing up, close up the mold and the life mask together so that this is now pushed into the space where your clay model was originally. So it takes on that same shape. You put it in an oven and you bake it for several hours and that cures the rubber when you open the mold, you take out this piece or number of pieces, depending on your number of molds, and um, they now have an interior shape that fits precisely on the actor's face, and the outside now has a new exterior, which is the old face. Gluing these on, now Jonathan was a wonderful uh, subject for this. He has a very good face. Uh, it has no difficult things to age. I mean, a person, say, with, say, very thick, youthful lips, it would be hard to cover up. Or uh, uh, other things might make it difficult to age them. In any case, Jonathan had a very good face for this sort of transformation. And he was very patient, very cooperative, good guy to work with. That really helps. Um, so putting on the makeup is also a trial on the actor. He has to sit still for hours. In this case, this is a very complicated makeup, covering really all his face and head. So it took, I guess, I, it's a long time ago now, but I think it was about three, three and a half hours. Once it's all glued on and painted and the hair put on, etc., uh, then it's, it, it will last uh, for eight or ten hours, sometimes more. Uh, when you're finished, then you have the cleanup process, and that can last for an hour or so that it's really glued on well. Anyway, Jonathan was very cooperative and uh, very effective, I thought. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a very, you know, fun job to do. As a matter of fact, it was kind of a, by, just by accident, it happened to be a rehearsal for the makeup I did on Dustin Hoffman and Little Big Man, where I had to make him 121 years old. Uh, on Jonathan, because he was so old, one of the key things is how do you make really old-looking eyelids? After all, the eyes are the most important feature. 
and old people have these really droopy, wrinkly eyelids. Well, eyelids of that sort had never been made before that really worked like real eyelids, that, that folded and unfolded, that blinked. So I, I worked very hard to develop that and partially succeeded with Jonathan. But it gave me the experience in order to do it even better on Dustin Hoffman. And then, when years later, uh, the scene with Jonathan was repeated in the Dark Shadows movie, I actually used the eyelids I made for Dustin Hoffman. I put them on Jonathan. So he kind of got paid back in the long run. After the early uh, TV Dark Shadows uh, makeup on Jonathan and Fred, uh, Dan asked me to work on his production of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I believe there were some other aging um, uh, makeups that were required for other uh, parts of the series. Uh, I'm not familiar with them. I wasn't involved with them. I don't know the reasons. Uh, maybe I wasn't available. In those days, it was very hard to find talented people. Now, it's so different. In the last 20 years, when special makeup effects era came in in the 70s, and, and articles and information and publicity and stories and pictures and everything about the wonders of special makeup effects and films like The Exorcist and uh, Planet of the Apes and all those things, all of that suddenly made youth conscious of the makeup profession and what an intriguing, fascinating, creative profession it was. When I got into it, I mean, except if I hadn't found that, that famous makeup book, I would never even thought of it. Nobody in my waspy class of youth, certainly no, no one else going to Yale, would ever thought of this as a profession. They would, they'd never heard of it hardly. Uh, so, and this is what was my problem. The people that I hired, none of them were, were dedicated, young, uh, talented artists. They were all kind of middle level. And it wasn't until, really, in the late 60s, when I first met young Rick Baker, the teenager, that I encountered someone who truly was made to be a makeup artist, who had the gift and was obvious. Right there, uh, and since then, it's been a whole different ball game. In that, everybody knows about the wonders of makeup, and young people who formerly would have gone into some kind of art world, uh, designer, uh, advertising, something of that sort, they would have thought would be good, challenging, and well-paying. All the talented people went into those fields. Nobody would even thought about makeup. All that's changed.
made generally uh, <coughs> uh, Max Factor. Other, uh, most, most of the cosmetic companies had a blood, but they all had something like a, a mineral oil or, a, a, or propylene glycol or some other material in it that would not dry and was uh, uh, loaded with, with pigment. And they looked terrible because they were very opaque. Uh, they looked like paint. And the colors were wrong. There was everything wrong about them. I changed that late, many, many years later. Uh, in, in black and white television or films, you didn't even have to have a red. Uh, sometimes we used a Hershey chocolate syrup, uh, ketchup, uh, all kinds of things were used. My name is Jack Crab, and I am the sole white survivor of the Battle of Little Big Horn, uh, uh, popularly known as Custer's Last Stand. <laughs> well, that's right, Johnny. I'm going to learn how to do all of those things. You'll see. We'll fool her. that the fascination at a, in, in your, your mid-teens with monster makeup is, of course, a mixture of things. Um, one of them, for instance, is this kind of ambivalent feeling we have about powerful creatures or monsters or superhuman creatures. We're fearful of them in that they represent supreme authority, all the authority figures that we, we feel persecute us whether they're parents or teachers or whoever. So we're fearful of that power, but we're also envious of it. We would like nothing better than to be the Superman or Frankenstein or, or any other uh, superhuman creature, because then we could get even with all these people who boss us around us, little kids, who get bossed around and pushed around and made to do things we don't want to do um, uh, that we, we are living through. The other great thing I mean, the other thing that I think is a factor uh, is our growing awareness as young people in our uh, mortality and our vulnerability. The fact that we can be brutally crushed. I mean, like you stamp on a bug. I mean, that we can be horribly hurt and that we're going to die someday. That this that doesn't go on forever like we thought when we were younger. And facing this, this is one of our, the big things that I think everyone has to face in life is death. And we're, we, we do it all our lives, and that's when it begins, I think, mm. is in those teens. And so, uh, so we, we see the monster as the person who can give death and hurt and all that, but on the other hand, if we can empathize, if we can get into him, if we can pretend that we are that, person on the screen, uh, inhabit that person, fine. Now imagine what makeup does. You literally become the monster, you physically be be make yourself up mm -hmm. as the monster. I, as Frankenstein, I had built up boots, a whole costume. Mm -hmm. I stormed around in a, in a, a Frankenstein movie in, in New Haven mm -hmm. uh, on a Saturday night. I had great fun. But, but to play act, to pretend, to take on the role of the aggressive uh, monster, superhuman creature, authority figure, whatever it is, is very gratifying and a great release. Mm. I was a person brought up, as is typical in those days, to be well behaved, to respect authority, to do what was expected of me, you know, to work hard, to earn love by being good and so forth. Uh, and no aggression. You don't show aggression. 
You don't show hateful feelings, anger, all that. You could never say, tell, tell your mother or father, I hate you, like they do today. <laughs> you know, all those things were in me, and all that kind of repression was released. When I could go and, and chase the, you know, run away from the campus cops or scare the other people and all that sort of thing, it was a wonderful exercise for an inhibited young man and letting out my aggressive feelings. What about the sheer creativity of it? I mean, oh, well, making a monster is just so much great work to do, but, too. But that's it. It's yeah. a whole mixed bag of mm -hmm. wonderful things. Mm -hmm. It's fantasy. It's imagining. It's creativity. It's, in, it's inventiveness. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the figuring out the materials to use, how to use them, how to mix A with B to get something different. Mm -hmm. All of that, mm -hmm. all of that is just hooked to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had the emotional release, and I had all these other things. The one final capper is that for a person who wants to always be in control, you take it, you you control it by you simply wipe it off. Mm -hmm. So you can be you can be the monster. It's like Jekyll and Hyde, except you don't get you don't get hooked in the end. Mm -hmm. You can always control it. Stick your cock up her ass, you motherfucking worthless cocksucker. Be silent! Oh. Oh.